this morning that the courts have utterly and completely been unwilling to enforce the Constitution. I agree that they have, in general, been unwilling to enforce the Constitution, but I think it's important to highlight that in very particular instances, there have been judges that have come forward and done the right thing. They have been overruled at times, mm. but they have come forward and done the right thing. So very briefly, I just want to <coughs> cite for you some of those, some of those key cases. Uh, in, in 1967, there, were, there was a case brought all the way to Supreme Court on behalf of, uh, in, in, during the Vietnam War, on behalf of armed uh, servicemen. And, and the point there was to highlight that they were harmed, that they had the standing uh, to bring these claims. And, and repeatedly, the courts were saying they didn't have the standing. And Justice Potter Stewart and Justice Douglas both dissented in that and made clear that this was a question of great import and that we cannot make these problems go away simply by refusing to hear the cases of three obscure army privates. Uh, further down the road, the bombing of Cambodia was, uh, was challenged in court by then Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman in New York and then Congressman Robert Drynan in Massachusetts, two separate courtrooms. Elizabeth Holtzman won a court order before the district court judge that said that bombing was unconstitutional, that it had not been declared, it violated the War Powers Clause of the Constitution. It then quickly was stayed by the higher courts, went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Marshall upheld the stay. They then went to Justice Douglas, and in a famous interaction on a porch in Washington State, they found him, and, and he reversed Justice Marshall's stay and said that, in fact, uh, the injunction needed to be put in place to stop the bombing. Justice Marshall telephonically went to the rest of the justices and reversed Justice Douglas's uh, decision. And so the fact is, is that we do have instances where there have been willingness to stand up. Now, the other judge who was appointed, uh, the judge who was appointed rather to Congressman Dryan's case, uh, and this is where I'll end, happened to be the judge assigned to the case we brought. Uh, 30 years later. And he had decided, in Father Drynan's case, that he could not intervene, and that courts cannot intervene, unless only the Congress and the President are in conflict with respect to a question of war. Now, this is made up law. Nowhere in the Constitution or the legislative history does this uh, take place, or the framers' history, rather. But he, he enunciated this principle that Congress and the President must be in conflict. So if Congress colludes with the President, conspires with the President, to violate the War Powers Clause, under his theory, the courts have no power to intervene. He then quickly uh, dismissed the case. We got to the Federal Appeals Court one week later in a very expert appeal. It usually takes like two years to get to the Federal Appeals Court. They heard it in a much more sober and clear way, and yet ultimately they stepped to the sidelines and refused to intervene. I think that what has to happen as part of this larger effort is that we have to keep bringing these matters back before judges. During the Vietnam War, there were repeated cases brought before the courts uh, that, that forced them to answer these questions. Frank Askin, who's a professor of law at Rutgers, has, in fact, brought another case. But I think we need to urge others to come forward. And that's why I brought up earlier today the notion that state attorneys general should be directed to bring these kinds of challenges as well on behalf of their state and on behalf of the members of the armed forces in their state. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Caleb Rossiter. I'm a professor at American University. I thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's wonderful to be with such energetic and creative people. Uh, the two Bens, I really enjoyed your presentations. And to be on with Ms. Bolger talking about the Oregon governor when I used to work for Senator Mark Hatfield, who I'm sure would have signed the order immediately, uh, is, is a real treat. Um, on the other hand, I'm going to talk about the war powers in practice, but before I do, I must tell you that I'm the skunk at your picnic. That's okay. um, my anti-imperialist heart is with everything I've heard here today. But my constitutional head is not with me. Uh, I know how important state-oriented campaigns have been to important grassroots movements like the Anti-Apartheid Act, um, to the Anti-Vietnam War Act. But to, to sort of paraphrase Merle Haggard, uh, when you're running down my Congress, you're walking on the fighting side of me. <laughs> Why has Congress done so little since 1973 when it passed the War Powers Act? 
mostly because people see the complicated, with apologies to John, concept of what the Constitution really means when they replace the words make war with declare war in some dusty corner of Constitution Hall in 1787 as a technical issue. When members want to make war somewhere, because they think it's a good thing, whether it's Bosnia, Kosovo, Somalia, Iraq, uh, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, suddenly they change their deep constitutional beliefs. They want it to happen if they think it's important, and they don't want a little constitutional uh, dispute that is going to go on in court forever and ever to get in the way. A very humorous thing occurred in uh, the Kosovo War, Congressman Tom Campbell forced a vote on the floor in which Congress, in a row, opposed getting out, opposed getting in, and then tied on the question of should we leave the troops there? <laughs> because Congress is not really set up to make this sort of decision on a constitutional ground, because the Constitution is so difficult to nail down. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about two things we've done the last two years when I worked for Congressman Delahunt who chaired a subcommittee that held hearings and wrote legislation on the War Powers Resolution and on the Iraq Long-Term Agreement. And I must say, from that experience, I see many familiar faces here today. We used to have long conversations, me and the people I see in the room in front of me. We would, we would, we would run like this. I would come down and whisper to them from the dais, if you don't put down those signs, the Capitol Police will have to evict you. <laughs> I'm glad to have the chance to do a little more speaking today. Uh, because our hearings were always being disrupted by people who wanted us to go a lot farther than we were. Let's take war powers. Congressman Walter Jones is sort of the real leader in the Congress, uh, at least putting out the words that implemented this report. And Jones introduced a bill to go back to the original War Powers Resolution. A bit of trivia is that Senator Eagleton, who wrote the War Powers Resolution, voted against it when it came back from the conference with the House, because it was a piece of crap, the one we have today. The original Eagleton War Powers Resolution, like the Jones Bill, which Delahunt wrote with him, is a constitutional use of Military Force Act, which doesn't have any 60-day exceptions for anything other than you know, the immediate defense of something in an emergency, which has never been questioned. So the War Powers Act that's there, nobody loves. The people who wrote it don't love it, because it doesn't really do what it's supposed to. So Jones had a bill to go back to the original War Powers Resolution. You cannot deploy troops into combat without Congress's approval. Now this would have stopped, of course, all sorts of deployments by every president you can imagine. Jimmy Carter dropped troops uh, from Morocco and France and Belgium into the Congo, into Zaire in 77 and 78 to keep Mobutu in power. He didn't bother to go to Congress for that. Thank goodness Gerald Ford respected the War Powers Act. He actually re reported the Mayaguez military operation after it was over. Um, President Reagan, uh, he went in Lebanon actually with the Congress supporting it. He didn't for Grenada, but he did a little bit. President Bush went both ways, first President Bush. Invaded Panama all on his own because an American woman got roughed up. Um, but he went to Congress. Uh, Secretary Baker forced him to go to Congress to get approval for the Iraq War. When the constant, the, the sort of the wide-eyed, what do you call those people? They're not the, is it the Federalist Society who are always pushing these extreme executive branch? C. Boyden Gray was their representative in the White House. He was the White House counsel, and he was telling Bush, "Don't go to Congress. You can go on your own." But Baker made him do it. Uh, Bill Clinton was probably the worst. Kosovo, Bosnia, the, the actual combat in Somalia, as opposed to the humanitarian relief operation that Bush did in late 92. These all were just Clinton claiming the right on his own to go. And so when you come to President Bush, who we all worked hard to resist in his military adventures, uh, he did get the authorization to invade Afghanistan. He did get the authorization to invade Iraq. You may not like it. I didn't like it. But uh, he initially went in with imprimatur. Now, the argument on war powers, which is what motivated Jones and Delahunt, is that the actual words of the 2002 resolution that put our troops in Iraq have expired. Because mm -hmm. you read the objective conditions that had to do with driving Saddam Hussein out of power. So Delahunt got very excited, and Jones got very excited, and held a series of, I don't know, ten hearings where I met all of you. And we were trying to <laughs> squanch... Um, this long-term agreement with Iraq, and effectively did, with the help of all of you and the Iraqi parliament, 
It went from being a long-term occupation agreement to a short-term withdrawal agreement. That was good. Delon would have voted for it in the end by the time they were done. It really was a withdrawal agreement, and we'll see next year that we hope that will come to pass. Um, but in terms of forcing that onto the floor, we had a bill that said you have to vote on this. And Barbara Lee, I believe, passed an amendment to the House that said, uh, and it passed the House but not the Senate, because they didn't have enough guts, as we heard earlier today, to actually hold up a defense appropriation when the Senate refused, that you couldn't spend any money on it unless Congress voted. What happened to that resolution? when Obama became president. Anybody know how hard the Democrats have pushed to put that on the floor since then? Because we're back where I started in our discussion. Now it's a Democratic president, all these so-called constitutionalists who live and die just for the Constitution and the Congress's obligation, not right, but obligation to send our troops in a harm's way. What happened? Now there's a Democratic president. They don't care so much. Um, the same thing happened with the War Powers Resolution, which we were trying to push the new bill, the Jones bill last year, had a series of hearings. On the other side, you have Baker and Christopher, two former secretaries of state, saying, as you've heard here today, we don't need any power at all. Uh, why isn't that being pushed now? We have a Democratic president. The Democrats no longer think it's such a burning issue. So war powers and these constitutional questions have such a poor reputation on the Hill. People feel it's a, it's a black hole you're going to fall into. They don't really mean it anyway, because when a war comes around, or a humanitarian operation, or a anti-genocide operation, or whatever, that you are going to agree with, you want to be able to do it, and you want your president to be able to do it, we've lost sight of the real constitutionalists in Congress. They have to be reaffirmed. I would like to see all the energy that I've heard here today about your grassroots work uh, with the states. Uh, frankly, focused on your members of Congress, um, rather than your state legislatures, because uh, the last time I bumped into this issue, this uh, understandable citizen outrage about their troops going off to an unconstitutional war, was during the Contra Wars in the 80s when I worked for Senator Hatfield. And some state legislatures didn't want to send their National Guard down to Honduras to take part in exercises that were essentially uh, creating the rear areas for the Contras to attack Nicaragua. And we had real knockdown dragouts at the staff sessions on the Hill with our allies in the anti-war movement, who we worked with very closely in the 80s, uh, who wanted us to have members of Congress support those state legislative efforts, which are somewhat similar to the ones you've got today. But you're, you're, you guys are tuned in, and it's much more sophisticated. But essentially, it's about states' rights, as we used to say back in the 60s, uh, versus the federal government's power to decide where troops are used. And uh, I'm not a big fan of states' rights, i got to tell you. That. <laughs> so we, we, we've been through this before, and we had to agree to disagree at that time, and that's great, because all the agitation at the local level, you're not going to win these things anyway and force the Congress to stop, or the President to stop the war, but you're going to raise the profile of the issue, make it unpopular, it's a very good local organizing tool. Don't get me wrong, I'm just saying, those of us who work in Congress and want to see Congress meet its constitutional obligations, uh, as I said earlier, you're walking on our fighting side when you try to say, oh, well, let's have the states uh, take care of these troops. But, uh, I, again, I don't mean to be too much of a skunk. I'm in tremendous admiration for the work that you're doing. Uh, I join you in this anti-imperialist vision of a demilitarized world, the United States leading the way. It's a little technical disagreement among friends as to whether the, um, you know, the feds or the states should take care of it. But I will say to John, I'm glad he stuck around. I remember this, just to give you a warning for how the Hill works, not with the reality or the, how the courts may work, in the 60s, the Beatles had this great song, Revolution, and they say, if you go carrying pictures of Chairman Mao, you're not going to make it with anyone anyhow. Okay. On the Hill, if you come up, John, as many, many expert witnesses have, talking about Chairman Jefferson and Chairman Madison and Chairman you know, Franklin and the Constitutional Convention and who said what in what draft, our eyes just glaze over. You're not going to make it with us because we're dealing with the modern constitutional understanding, which is up for grabs and is messy. We're not, we don't care about that. That stuff's gone, as far as the Congress is concerned. And on that charming and cheery note, I thank you very much.